Hey everybody, welcome to Data Engineers Lunch number three. We actually have been a long running group uh, in the DC community for a while and uh, just recently restarted our virtual meetup as a lunch meeting. Um, today's topic is going to be scripting shell automation for data engineering. Um, and well, when we get started, I'll actually show we're actually following a path of what it takes to be a data engineer. So this is one of the, the crucial you know, skills. Uh, Akwi, uh, my co-organizer, thank you so much for recording this session. So it's uh, gonna be available on YouTube later. Akwi also helps produce the blog post that gets out there with all of the references and links so you don't have to take notes yet. <laughs> um, always looking for people to help uh, find speakers um, you know, get, get the word out. These days we don't need sponsors. Zoom is pretty, pretty cheap. Uh, Data Community DC is a much larger group. Uh, we are part of a very diverse and inclusive um, environment of professionals. Um, and if you know somebody from a different background, race, gender, creed, love to help them uh, get their word out, uh, especially if they're underrepresented. We are one of, as you can see, tw 12 different meetups. And what do we cover here? We cover data engineering, uh, which is the middle of everything now uh, in terms of in, you know, information technology, especially digital technology. Um, and you know, what we talk about is stuff related to sometimes uh, not only data engineering, but how does it relate to data science? How does it relate to data analysis? How does it relate to software engineering? Um, and if you have a new way of doing data processing, data engineering, um, love to have it shown here. We've covered uh, in the past before data engineers lunch, we've talked about stream processing, using Python, using Flink, uh, you name it, different technologies uh, for data wrangling and data processing. All right, uh, normally if somebody's new to the group, you get to say hi and introduce yourself. And actually I should be showing my face, but I'm not, I'm sorry. Um, so we have at least one new face. Uh, William, do you wanna introduce yourself? Who are you? What do you like about data? You know, what do you wanna get out of this? And most importantly, what could you present on? Sure, Rahul, it's, it's been a while. I think the last time we spoke was uh, back when your offices were in Georgetown. Um, but yeah, my name is Will Angel. Um, I actually help organize the Data Visualization DC Meetup group. And if you get the Data Community DC newsletter, I'm currently the one sending those out. Um, uh, and I do a, a mixture of data science and data analytics. Uh, I'm probably gonna be starting a new role doing uh, as a analytics product owner in the next couple of weeks, pretty exciting. Um, I'm always looking to uh, improve, improve my data engineering skills because, you know, on all that data science, data visualization work and data engineering ends up taking most of the time if we want to do things correctly. Um, one of the things that I've been starting to dabble in is airflow. So if we want to do a presentation on that, give me a couple of weeks and I can put something together. Definitely, definitely. In fact, I am putting it in the the backlog. Uh oh, excellent. <laughs> awesome. Good to be here. Excited to see that these are starting again. Yes, yes, oh, we are too. And it looks like uh, David is joining. Give him a, a minute. Uh, David, uh, I think you are new to our data engineers lunch. You want to just say hi, who you are, and uh, you know, how do you deal with data, and what could you potentially, you know, present on. I think we, we have a couple of different topics rolling around, but uh, we have a backlog. So anything new in the last week that's that's exciting? This David? Yes. Okay. Um, I, oh wow, I'm kind of new to doing data engineering, was an infrastructure guy most of the time, and right now we're doing lots of Azure stuff, and so I'm doing Azure function apps to cool. uh, ingest log data, typically it's, it's mostly a cybersecurity uh, a solution or, or problem. Um, so yeah, doing a lot of the Azure and some other sources, uh, API requests to, to ingest logs, uh, 
setting them up with a rudimentary at the moment, kind of data lake on blob storage. Uh, just kind of showing them that Splunk might not always be the answer. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm literally working with Splunk on my other computer right here. <laughs> yeah. It's a cool product though. It, it does a lot of cool stuff. <laughs> not everything though. Well, I tell them it's their easy button, so don't, don't think I want them to get rid of it, but uh, there's some things they're missing with it. Awesome, thank you. Uh, and I think those are the new faces for today. Uh, by the way, uh, David, I did put Azure functions and maybe just Azure data wrangling techniques uh, as a backlog item. Uh, so we'll get in touch to see if you want to present on something in the next couple of weeks. Um, all right, so group rules. Uh, we've always kept these rules. If you have a question, just ask it uh, with Zoom. Just put it in the chat box. Um, or if you are so inclined, you can just, you know, just be, you can interrupt and just say, hey, I've got, I've got something to add to that. Uh, this is a conversation. Um, as I, you know, was one of the uh, organizers that took over this group, um, you know, one of my main roles is that if there isn't a speaker, I'll find something to speak on. But um, uh, the ideal is that it's a conversation. Uh, and, you know, we've done in the past, we've done things like panel discussions. And so that's another option for the future as well. Um, one of our sponsors uh, for another meetup uh, is, is Datastax, and uh, they've been uh, fortunate to be involved with Data Wranglers uh, for a while, uh, as well as uh, GW University, who has given us a venue space, which we're not using right now, but hopefully we will in 2021. Uh, we have some local sponsors, as well as our organizational sponsors, um, who make this all possible. All right, any announcements uh, for you know, anybody who's hiring, anybody who's looking for a job, meetups, hackathons, conferences, classes coming up? Okay. Um, so just in general, Data Community DC has a lot of monthly events. Um, this is our weekly lunch call. You're always welcome to join. Uh, same place, same time on Mondays. Um, this is actually done, sorry about that. Um, I guess I don't know where this thing is. Strike through. Oh, well. Oh, well. Okay. There is a, a, a presentation today on uh, just counting, and there's like some spark involved uh, in, in relationship to Cassandra and uh, data stacks. Uh, it's happening right now on YouTube Live, um, somewhat of a scheduling thing, but uh, definitely worth a look later on on YouTube if you want to take. Uh, Take a look at how to do counting in a NoSQL database, or basically, uh, you know, with user-defined functions and user-defined aggregates, as they're called in Cassandra. Um, today, we are going to uh, talk about, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, scripting and shell automation as one of the you know core skills if you're becoming a data engineer. And uh, I always find it fascinating. I learn something new about you know Unix shell commands every time I retouch them after you know playing with them for 20 years. Um, the, the general path uh, we started on is we talked a bit about um, programming uh, in different languages as a main skill set uh, in data engineering. We're talking today about scripting and automation, um, you know, different ways to manipulate data without necessarily programming in Python. Uh, I think shell scripting itself is a programming language. But um, the idea that you don't have to be a you don't have to get into a formal, uh, you know, higher level programming language to do some data manipulation. Um, we talked about uh, different types of, uh, you know, ETL frameworks, whether they're serverless or whether it's based on JVM or, or uh, CLR, uh, even some topics around Node. Um, and today we're talking about just generally, you know, the top tools in shell scripting and automation. Um, you know, Bash is probably the most common shell scripting that's installed and in, on every Unix or Mac OS. And you use it when you start using a, a Linux for the first time. And it's ironic that, you know, when I started playing around with Unix, uh, or excuse me, I did play around with Unix because I was lucky to go to a high school which had like real Unix computers, um, like digital and uh, Unisys and, and so on and so forth. But 
we also were experimenting with Linux. And this is back in like 1996, 1997. Linux was not common. And Macs did not run Mac OS X. And so I got familiar with Bash uh, fairly early. Um, and there were other shells, and there are other shells still that are really cool. But Bash is kind of the, I think, the most common one. Um, and these days, actually, Bash works not only on Linux and any Unix variant that you can find, but it nowadays actually also works in Windows, in Windows subsystem for Linux, as well as the latest, uh, one of the Bash projects on Microsoft's GitHub is actually running Bash natively to Windows. It's kind of cool. Um, and then PowerShell, which used to only be for Windows, um, is based on the CLR. Uh, it's a very, very powerful um, programming environment, shell, shell environment, which um, you know you can you can write in in uh, you can you can manipulate objects and you can manipulate uh, attributes of objects, um, not just the system, not just the Windows system, but also data uh, in a very rich environment. And PowerShell is now also available on Windows, so the world is kind of turned upside down in the last twenty years. Um, the biggest, I think the baddest, uh, when I say baddest, I think people uh, sometimes mis misuse cron, but cron is probably the most um, used and abused tool for data engineering that I've seen. Um, if you're not familiar with cron, uh, you should get used to it because um, it is the easiest way to schedule something, right? Um, and, as, and by the way, guys, this is a general data engineers lunch where we're going through this path. So there's a bunch of you know people that are completely new to data engineering. So that's why we're getting real basic right now. Um, so you know, cron job basically is a um, it's a way to set up a command, any command. It could be a Java command that you say Java and you know run this jar file, or it could be a Python. You can say Python three this dot pi. Any command that you would run on on a Linux machine on on Bash or any shell you can tell the system to schedule it in a particular way. And the, the format is basically uh, a simple format where uh, you give it cron and you give it this, there's like a little bit of a syntax where you say, for example, you know, run every hour uh, between um, nine to 6 p.m. every day, uh, every month, uh, and I think basically every year. Um, but at the end of the day, um, or it's like, sorry, minute, hour, day of the month, day, month of the year, and then day of the week. And uh, you can play around with this, but there, there's always examples. Like if you wanted to just figure out how do I run a command every Wednesday, just Google it, you'll find somebody. But um, there's so many examples, but eventually you just, you can, you can figure it out. It's not that uh, difficult. Um, and you don't have to run cron to put this into the schedule, what you can do is you can edit the cron tab, which is basically the cron table. Um, and it's an etc slash cron tab. And that's all really I'm gonna get into. But imagine you, you want data to get copied from S3 to your local computer for some data processing uh, or vice versa. This is an easy way to do it, right? As long as you can run a command, you can tell cron to run it for you on a recurring basis. Um, Going back to workflowy uh, here, um, cron super useful tool. It's like in its own right, it'll help you with um, running any data processing or data engineering task you have in sequence, right? So you can always say, run this at eleven o'clock at night, run this at one a.m. in the morning, run this at three p.m. So you can basically sequence a data pipeline if you wanted to in cron um, without having any special tools like. Airflow, which is really super cool, and I, I think I'll I'm, um, I'll be looking forward to that presentation on it. Um, the next most useful tool, in my opinion, is um, Grep. Uh, Grep is um, I, I I don't know when I have not used it, but I mean I basically use Grep on a pretty much on a daily basis, looking at data, finding you know basic patterns in data. And grep, uh, basically, uh, most of the time, what you do with the grep is you say, show me this file. So you can say cat x, cat xyz file. You pipe it, and then you say grep, and then you give it the command that you want to look for. Uh, I don't really use grep um, by itself. You can always use grep by itself. Um, but some of the, the useful ways to use grep in a data processing environment or data engineering process would be 
um, let's say for log processing, right? You only want to send logs to Splunk <laughs> that are errors or warnings, right? So you could basically say, take this log, dump it to this other file, and this is the file that I want to go into Splunk. I don't want everything to go into Splunk. Or, um, you know, this is the output of uh, this data engineering process. Uh, I just want to get XYZ rows. And it, sorry, it, I couldn't hear what you said. Sorry about that. Um, but grep is doing it on a line by line basis. It's not doing it at like a paragraph or a sentence basis. It's a very dumb search. Uh, and it does things like, you know, case insensitive, sensitive, um, if you want it. Um, this is useful if you want to do some pre processing for actual processing. Um, and then there are uh, a bunch of Unix commands that, you know, I'm not going to go into each one because um, it might get a little boring, but um, that you should take a look into. This is going to get up, you know, put up into the blog post, but cut uh, is a command which you can use to cut sections of a file, like especially if there's delimiters or columns, you can say just get this column from the CSV file or just get these characters um, from you know, character number zero to character number 15 from this file that may have 50 characters in a file, right? That's really uh, an amazing tool if all you care about is like one column of a file, right? You don't necessarily have to go interpret it into, you know, put it into a, a pandas data frame and do some you know, crazy uh, parsing if you just want X column or X set of characters from, uh, from a file. Um, diff and compare. Uh, compare is at the byte level. Uh, maybe you want to check if a data file has changed, like a, like a zip file. If it's changed between the last time you ran a job to get data into the system, you can do a compare. And if there's no difference between the last run and, and the current set of data, you shouldn't have to rerun that data. Well, it depends on what you're doing, but you know, more than likely if you're doing a data ingestion or something like that. Um, diff, on the other hand, is looking at an ASCII file as a text file. And it will do a line by line, um, you know, whether there's an addition or a deletion or an update to a particular file. Um, this is useful if you're doing your own change data capture, right? So you have a big file that comes in, it's a database dump um, as a CSV, and you have to process just the changes. Well, you can use diff to see what's different, take the output of that, put it into another file, and then process that output instead of processing the full file itself. Um, and you know, by the way, these programs are written in C, which is basically the fastest, other than writing in assembly, like C is the fastest programming language, period. That's why all operating systems are written in C. Um, I think that is still the fastest. I mean, I'm pretty sure that <laughs> nothing is faster than C right now. Uh, C++ is good, but it's either written in C or it's written in C++. These tools are not uh, you know, running in the JVM, they're not running uh, in as an interpreted program. It's really, really, really fast. And if you have a, a good chunk of CPU and, and memory, these programs can do really good damage in terms of uh, processing. Um, unique and sort sometimes go together, uh, where you have data, uh, you say, you know, uh, how many new records and updates on the chat here? Uh, and with good compilers, most C, C++ is faster than hand optimized. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I don't know who wants to go through the, um, the, the pain of, of doing assembly programming. And I just saw the chat message from Will. Um, I'm going to put this up on the screen and I'll, I'll repeat it at the, in the, at the end of the session today. But there's a, a, a meetup tonight, uh, virtual project night, uh, DataViz DC. Um, <laughs> And I'll give you a chance to talk about it, Will, right before we end. Okay, sorry. Sounds good. I didn't see that earlier. Uh, back to, uh, so unique and sort are very useful. Uh, so what you can do is you can say, uh, you know, take this data and um, maybe cut the first column, sort it, and then give me the unique. And you'll basically get only the unique uh, at, you know, whatever the value is for all the data that's in there. Um, or, uh, you know, vice versa. You could just say, take this file and give me the uniques at the very beginning. Right? Make sure there's no duplicate lines in that file. Um, and, and by the way, I, I, I'm not showing you the whole data process. I think that's a 
a more advanced topic, but just imagine if you're doing any of these operations in Python or in Java, that you are probably taking five to 10 times more processing power to do this, that, um, yeah, <laughs> we'll just send something here. Um, basically, you know, uh, in Hadoop takes 26 minutes and command line takes 12 seconds. I'll bring this, I'm actually gonna add this to the- yeah, It's an incredibly fun blog post with some pretty, pretty detail, pretty good details about how to actually do the, do the data manipulation there. That's awesome. This is so cool. Uh, let me go ahead and add this as a general link here. Um, wow. Yeah, yeah. I think I've read this before. And uh, basically, it goes through doing cats, greps, uh, awk to get, and I'm going to talk about awk, awk in a second. Uh, you can uh, parallelize. Uh, yeah. This is the pro grade command line tutorial. <laughs> uh, if you can do this, you could probably like do your job at least 235, uh, sorry, at most 235 times faster. But uh, I mean, basic data engineering uh, at the very beginning is really dumb stuff. And this stuff can really help. Um, and the more you know about Unix commands, the, the better you are in general. Um, uh, trim is a way to trim characters or to do tr basic translations like uppercase, lowercase. I don't know what else it does. Uh, I can take a look. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah, uppercase or lowercase, squeezing repeating characters, deleting specific characters, and basic find and replace. So by the way, set can also do find and replace, but this can do some basic find and replace. Um, really, really uh, awesome tool. Um, and going back. Um, but if I were to, you know, sink my teeth into something to to really uh, for for data purposes, it would be said in awk. And um, you know, said is it stands for stream editor. Um, and when when we say a stream, it can not only operate on a file, it can operate on like a tail. Like when you say tail x y z file, and the file is continuously changing, said can operate on that stream itself. Um, and by the way, that's pretty much with all of the, the commands I'm talking about here. But in terms of data process, um, said is amazing because you can take a stream of data, add things to it, delete things, search and replace with regular expressions, which is much better than, than TR. Um, and then the other tool is, is awk. And awk is basically, you know, uh, it, you can split it. You can do line splits or you can do field splits. Um, and you know, set and awk are commonly used for um, you know in, in conjunction, right? Uh, what could you do? You could say, looking at this file, um, you know, do a search in place, do the XYZ clean process. Maybe you do some of these sort unique functions, um, and then do an awk process on it. Meaning, you know, take this line, put it into fields, uh, do this. And by the way, you can do addition. You can do some string concatenations. You can do like. A basing functions on here. Um, I don't I haven't used the the conditionals, but I've definitely used formatting output and uh, basic math and string operations on here. Super fast, right? This is super fast. Um, what does an awk command look like? So, like, let's say you have this file here, right? Um, you can say, you know, show me everything in the file, and basically shows you everything in the file. Um, or you can say, just show me the lines with this. And, but it's not just that, it knows columns. The basic default, you know, delimiter is space. Um, and you can also, you can, you can override that, but this is one, two, three, and four. And we can say, just show me columns one and four, and it'll just output that. So you can already see if, if you're looking at any basic structured data, awk is very, very useful. Um, and then we have here, um, uh, oh, I didn't show you guys said, let's take a look, quick look at said. Um, said, you know, again, you want to do a search and replace on a file, set is the tool to use, right? This is, let's say, searching for Unix, replacing with Linux. Um, you can do things like on a particular line or on a particular, I mean, and regular expressions are a whole different kind of programming language in itself. I'm actually messing with regular expressions on Splunk. I was messing with it right before this, this uh, meetup. Um, but that's a, you could have a whole like college course on grep, uh, excuse me, on, on regular expressions. And I, I'm not even that much of a master at it. Uh, and I've been playing with 
with regular expressions for like 20 years and I don't, I don't even know what, what's truly possible. It's a really powerful tool. Um, but, um, you know, you can do as much of this, if you can do as much of your string operations in the Unix command line or the Linux command line, you're going to save yourself a lot of data processing time. And that's really what the goal is with these tools. Since they're compiled, um, they're basically the, as good as it gets in terms of, you know, um, basic operations uh, speed. Um, JQ is relatively new. And JQ is new because JSON itself is a relatively new data format. Um, and, you know, JQ is also compiled, I believe, um, in, in, in C or C++, it's because as far as I have seen, it's super fast. Um, but essentially, it's like said for JSON, right? That's what it is. Um, so let's say you have this data in this JSON, um, and you want to just get, let's say, the first row, uh, or if you want to get just the, these two, you know, column, uh, co well, these two fields out of this data, um, you can reformat this basically to be what you want it. And the way you do that is you you can look at a file. You can just say cat this file, uh, and when you pipe it to JQ, dot means give me everything. Right, that's that's the root. Um, or you can go deeper. You can say, you know, get me one level deeper. So in this case, dot name would be this object inside the root. Um, or dot ID will give you just ID. And uh, and similarly, you can go down the hierarchy. Uh, you can get um, uh, like, for example, if it's an array, you can get just one or two or three, like specifically that index. Um, so you can say, give me dot terms, the first item in that array, right? Um, and it's, again, it's, it's JSON. It's uh, the common, one of the most common data formats out there today, right? Uh, it's worth taking a look at JQ. Um, I have actually used JQ in a real-time API processing scenario where it was, a lot of data was coming in. And we were taking it from the HTTP process and piping it to a, a Linux command line, running it through JQ, because it was faster than running it through JSON, running it through JavaScript. You know, who knew, right? It's super fast. Um, so it's, it's J, JQ is well, one of my favorites, for sure. Um, and then finally, uh, there are other tools out there um, that you can Google. I wasn't going to walk through every, every single one of them. Um, Pretty much in every programming language, you're going to find these functions, right? JSON to CSV, CSV to JSON, whatever you're looking for. Um, but if you just look for JSON to CSV, let's see if this is in C or C++. Oh, this one's written in Go. I mean, Go is pretty good too. Uh, Go is fast. Um, but basically you can say, you know, take this JSON file and give me the CSV of it, or give me this CSV file and give me the, uh, the JSON equivalent. And that would be a different tool. And that would be CSV to JSON. Uh, and if you're like me, you commonly will come across people giving you data in uh, XML. And I'm like, I don't want to deal with XML. Uh, so let's take a look at XML to JSON. And, um, and, and by the way, you, you'll find these things like, oh, this is a node package. Who cares, right? It's a command line tool. And you can install it using NPM, and you can run it on the command line, and it'll be pretty fast. Um, just because it's distributed with node package manager doesn't mean that it's written in JavaScript, doesn't mean that it's going to be slow. You know, JavaScript is written in C, C++. So um, let's say, let's take a look at this XML to JSON. What is it written in? Uh, okay, so well, looks like these guys. Uh, let me see if I go dig deeper. What is this written in? This may be actually written in, in JavaScript. So <laughs> uh, sometimes that's the best we can get. Um, let me take a look at lib. All right, yeah, so this one's written in JavaScript, you know, big deal, it's okay, All right? But if you're really specific, you can say compiled JSON to, oh, I'll just say XML to JSON. And this is a Perl one, 
Yeah, Pearl is a, I don't know why I didn't mention Pearl. I don't know, I forgot about Pearl. But um, Pearl is very, very powerful. Pearl was the OG of data processing uh, and string manipulation back in the day. Uh, basically what people would say, oh, I know Python, right? People would say, I know Pearl. That was a script, scripting language back then. And it's super powerful still. Um, but it looks like this is a C++ version of the same tool, right? And you can use it inside C++ program. Um, so that's kind of the, the landscape as far as I know in terms of command line tools. Um, do any of you guys know other tools that are worth mentioning that uh, one should know about um, in terms of you know, command line tools for processing data? I think there's other ones that I've used. Um, I'm going to put Perl in here just because um, I don't know who still uses Perl. Let me do a Google Trends on it. Well, let me, let me see. Will or David, uh, JB, Promode, Arpin, Aqui, any, anybody here, have you guys used Perl in the last, I don't know, 10 years? No? <laughs> I've 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 seen it used, uh, but not personally. You know what it is. Okay, good. <laughs> that that counts. <laughs> um, I'm doing a, a quick search of Perl versus Python to show you guys. Uh, but um, let's see what we got here. And I think one of the the things that I'll I'll chime in. Ooh, wow. <laughs> Um, maybe if I change this to high level programming language, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I, I was just going to say that when talking about, you know, uh, command line programming, it's always helpful to remember that Python can be done as, as a, as a command line, uh, interface, uh, even better if you move to something that's, uh, semi-permanent like Jupyter notebooks there, you know, if the limiting factor is not computing performance, but your time, uh, you can be very, very productive at prototyping some data manipulation in Python. Yep, absolutely. Um, and I think that's one of the, uh, if it's not already one of the um, backlog items, I believe we were talking about potentially using, you know what, let's, let's, uh, let's put that in there. Like, you know, how to go from, I'll just say how to operationalize. <laughs> Because that's a common um, challenge, uh, in, at least in my work environment, different clients, they're using Jupyter or Jupyter Hub, and then, you know, with the show them how to like get to the next level. Um, but yeah, definitely. And uh, you're, you're absolutely right about, I mean, Python, once you write the program in Python, um, you can put it into the lineup of the data process, right? That's the cool part about it. And, and you can run it as a cron job. You don't have to have anything fancy for, 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 for any of this. Um, and let's see. Yeah, so just wanted to show how interesting it is that the inflection point was basically August 2008 um, when, you know, Perl just kind of like, well, Python overtook Perl, but P Perl was already kind of on a decline. And it's possible not because of Python, but rather because of stuff like um, uh, let's say node would be one, uh, because people were using Perl for a lot of like CGI. Um, and then I would also say, uh, like ASP classic and P on oh no, a PHP. That's it. PHP killed Perl. That's what happened. That's what happened. I am now it's coming back to me. Um, yeah. Uh, but it looks like PHP is also on a general decline. Uh, maybe you have to go back further, but looks like Google doesn't have infinite history. Um, but that's interesting. I, I didn't think about uh, when Perl went away. It just kind of faded in, off into the distance uh, for data processing. Uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating. I know, I know a lot of scientists, like not data scientists, but like just like bioengineering or genetic, uh, you know, information scientists. They would use Perl for a lot of the data processing because that's that was what was available, and it could do a lot of data handling back then. Um, so cool. Um, 
All right, so I kind of wrapped up um, what I wanted to cover in terms of the, the, the shell scripting stuff. Um, I'm gonna actually go back to the deck and let Will talk a little bit about, uh, where did it go? You had shared with me, uh, there it is. Oh, yep. Yeah, go ahead, Will. Cool. Uh, so tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. we are having a data visualization project night. So if you have a data visualization project that you want to work on or share, or just want to come and talk shop about data visualization, feel free to join us. Awesome. And uh, is it like structured? Uh, are people just, is there a lineup or is anybody can come and just say, hey, I want to show something? Yep, yep, Any, anyone can come. These these project nights are fairly, fairly informal and casual. Um, but we do usually have a, a lineup for other events of more like webinar style data visualization presentations. I like it. I, I think the, uh, the this is a better search term for, for people to understand than like lunch. Maybe we'll, uh, we'll call a data engineers project lunch. <laughs> Though to be, to be fair, you know, since, since going virtual, it's very rare that people actually make real progress on a project. It's more about the, the socialization. Yeah, no, I totally get it. I mean, it's like the night owls, right? The night owls, which is now part of data communities. I remember when it first started and nobody was working on their project. <laughs> people were just hanging out and just like drinking beers and just kind of chilling at the, uh, I think it was at the general assembly back then. I don't know, but uh, is night owls still happening? Um, Trying to think. Yeah, so night night owls, I think, is uh, at this point dormant. Um, one group that actually I think we should uh, make introductions to uh, that we're just in the pr final processes of uh, getting into the the community is the data ops DC meetup. Ooh. Um, and nice. there, because there, there's a, lo a lot of overlap between data engineering and data ops. Definitely. Um, no, that's a that's a another term next to DevOps. Data ops is now becoming real. So um, this is data council I'm trying to think. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll post a, a link to them just a second. Awesome, very cool. I uh, would love to, to collaborate with them. Um, I'm glad somebody did it. I mean, the, the market is out there for people. I mean, like, honestly, um, the reason that we do the meetups and you know this will is that um, as, a, as a practitioner, it's really to teach people how to do stuff because yeah. not, that many people know how to do stuff. Um, so this is cool. Yeah, and if you if you pull up uh, Google Google Trends of uh, you know, data you know data ops and uh, ML ops, there's a lot of buzz around machine learning operations. Oh yeah, totally, totally, totally. I'm gonna just quickly bring that up here. And uh, one of that, I think that that real pain point for that was mentioned earlier of going from you know Jupyter notebooks to something that's actually fit for production yeah. that is a a huge pain point for for a lot of things but i think especially for data and machine learning compared to regular application development it's less there's a much clearer boundary between a prototype and a real system because okay? for a web application the prototype has to be online has to work that's not true for machine learning or data engineering yeah and you know um like right now, uh, without disclosing too much detail, but like in terms of technology, right? So like Databricks um, is a technology we've commonly come across uh, for Spark, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's selling a notebook first environment, right? And so they have some ability where you write a notebook and you can include other notebooks and whatnot. Um, and then you can run the notebooks as a job. You can say run this, via API and you can, you can do a cycle with that. But eventually, eventually, if you wanna have common code, they recommend compiling it as a jar and compiling it, putting it into a package and then deploying it as a package so that everybody can use it. So it's not just for um, you know, people that don't pay for all this cool data ops software, it's for everybody that eventually you need to think long-term, how does this data process become more optimized um, you know, an engine. Um, and I think that, I think that's, that's even true without notebooks. Uh, like for example, if you write a, you know, Python script to do some ETL there, you know, you put on a cron job and it works, but it's not, you know, it, it works, it, it does what it needs to do, 
but do you have monitoring? You know, if it breaks or starts putting in bad data, do you have data testing, quality, all that? Yeah, so, yeah like the, the whole um, move to, for example, managed everything, right? Let's put everything on a managed system um, managed by somebody else. I'm all for that. But then you eventually still have to come back to, did the job run? Did it run successfully? Did the thing end up in the right place? Um, or, uh, you know, even if you don't have to manage the hardware, uh, I think, David, I mean, I'd love to hear your thoughts on when you go to serverless functions, for example, because you're talking about Azure functions, like how do you orchestrate all that stuff together? Like what's been your challenge with that and operationalizing that? Uh, my client right now really isn't to that point yet, but um, we've taken, I, I've used Data Factory a bit for some of those items. Uh, it, it's running the gamut, but we're a little immature in that we've got stuff in Data Factory, we've got functions that run. Um, I've got web, I've used web hooks here and there with just like PowerShell. Mm -hmm. um, but probably the bulk of our work right now is a virtual machine with uh, C sharp code running on it. Gotcha. So you mentioned PowerShell, so you actually use it for some of the stuff, is it to wrap your C sharp code or is you actually have uh, C sharp in your PowerShell? That was just a, and it, it's not, it's not currently in use. That was, that was just a small job that honestly, I can't remember what I was using that for, but it just had such before that Azure changed that the web hook and the, uh, they changed your name so often. I'm forgetting the, uh, the orchestrator that they had. That, oh, for, for data processing? Um, for any kind of job, honestly. Um, and oh, this was, I think it's like cloud scheduler or like something like that. I, is that what you're talking right. about? Exactly. And they, they, they've since changed it. But um, yeah, yeah we're, we're, again, we're, we're a bit on the immature side and everything's just going into blob storage and then any real, uh, well, I mean, I don't think they do any ETL or any, any Thing beyond reporting in, in Splunk. Mm -hmm. So that's that's where I'm trying to get them in a more mature state to where they start combining some of their data sets mm -hmm. and and doing doing that kind of work and ha having creating data sets from the, just their 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 lake of blobs uh, of log data blob. Gotcha. So we're not there yet. Gotcha. Here we go. Yeah, it was called scheduler and then they are retiring it. Um, to basically, uh, they're calling it uh, logic apps, kind of like yeah. getting you to buy into their whole ecosystem, um, which is a damn shame, by the way, because every client that we have eventually asks this question, every client, if they're on the cloud, hey, is there a cloud version of cron? <laughs> yeah. Every single client asks that question. And I'm like, yeah, you might want to run Jenkins or you might want to run Airflow because there's really, not a lot of good one. I think um, Azure, I mean, AWS has something, um, but uh, I, I kind of play around with it. Um, but, and then th this whole world of using serverless functions uh, for ETL or data processing is fairly new. Um, so that's why it's, it's I mean, I, I want to say so much of it is the same, but so much of it is different, right? When I say so much of it is the same, it's like, using command line tools that we're talking about, breaking it up into steps um, and having a place for that data to go in um, and then have it picked up by another process. I mean, so much of that is basically the same. It's just that when you start thinking event-based, everything is you know one event coming in uh, and it has to be processed. Um, it, it, it forces you to change your mindset about uh, work. And um, we covered this a while ago in the same meetup, but Batch is still relevant. Like batch processing is still super relevant. It's not going to go away, you know. Um, as is event-based streaming. So you kind of have to have this like somewhere in the middle. Uh, what works uh, for everything. Um, and uh, you know, on that note, for that that diagram, how, with a with a little bit of time, how much of that do you think you could accomplish with a single shell script in a cron job? Oh, totally. <laughs> oh no, no, absolutely. Yeah. It's it's mind-boggling. And you know what the 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 question I ask is, what is the driving motivation to do this in serverless? 
Okay, and essentially sometimes they say cost, right? Oh, it's gonna cost less. And I'm like, okay, well, what about just doing this in a Docker container, running it, running it on, on ECS or, or even EKS, have it do its job and then go away. Like it's perfectly fine for that. Uh, and then there is really no good answer, except it's such a massive thing. We wanna be 100% based on cost uh, sorry, based on uh, usage, uh, we want to only pay for what we're using. But I mean, the engineering, the re-engineering to go from a basic dockerizable or whatever, Sparkable, right? Even Spark is such a general purpose tool now. What you can do in Spark or Docker or Kubernetes, you really have to be stretching it to get to pure serverless. Um, and I'm not saying that it's not a good technology. I'm just saying like for data processing, I'm really trying to figure out if it's Maybe I have to take that leap of faith and say, the business has to be 100% real time. And like, this is what you need, right? Um, Cause like, you know, what's what's the goal eventually? It's like, what's the goal? What are we trying to do here? Um, the serverless functions, David, did you guys use uh, C-sharp serverless functions? You said you just kind of like played with it, but what did you use for the programming language? C-sharp. C-sharp. Um, yeah. I'm stronger in Python, so I've got some Python projects that I'm going to go through or send through. Um, probably use their their Dockerized uh, function apps just for that. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, and like, what's the start? I mean, I know C Sharp is just in time compiled, but like, what's the startup time and like execution of that script? Um, I would have to tell. I'd have to go look. I don't have it off the top of my head. It's not a highly stressed. Oh, okay, gotcha. Function app at the moment, so it's it's that's that's not the my biggest concern. <laughs> gotcha. I I know it's it's one of those many things that you know you have to do. I know I have to do, but I don't know yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, Will, what about you? What kind of stuff have you uh, worked on in the serverless realm? Yeah, in in serverless, uh, very very little. Uh, for the most part, it, because of a combination of not having experience with it and thinking that it's usually you know overkill and over engineered, <laughs> yeah. I've avoided it. But like you're talking about containers, um, I think everybody's touched containers. How do you use containers these days for data? Yeah, my my preference is to deploy them to EC2, or if it's a personal project, just run them locally. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Gotcha. So like actually running an EC2 with Docker installed versus like using the ECS managed Docker? Yeah, though using ECS is probably a smarter move these days, but there is something to be said for the, the simplicity of just, you know, just using compute and storage, uh, you know, yeah. so like EC2 and RDS and, yeah. you know, yeah. that, that way they, there it means you can uh, portability, you can run it on just about any hardware uh, and the lowered you know, deployment architecture and thought process uh, yeah. is pretty big. Granted, most of the things that I work on are small enough where you don't need any truly massive systems, right. which makes those decisions a lot easier. Gotcha. Yeah, um, I was at reInvent last year when it was in, still in person and uh, they were releasing, they had, Fargate was already out there, but they were releasing Fargate for Kubernetes. Um, but Fargate is basically serverless ECS. So you just say run this container and it runs and just, if it's a long running job, it'll, or it's a long running process, it'll keep running and it'll scale as it gets hits or needs traffic, or I think you tune it. Same thing with uh, Fargate for EK, uh, EKS. Um, and that's, that's, I think, what the goal is. Like for serverless, it's kind of that, right? You just write some code and you deploy it and it does its own thing. Um, so I think it's like the, the, the serverless container world and the serverless function world are like, like almost at the same level in terms of ease. Um, I believe Azure has had for a long time, they've had app containers for the, for the longest time. Um, and I, and I think that's what the web jobs thing is as well. Like you can say, here's some code that runs, you know, in the background somewhere. Um, such a far cry from what uh, we used to do. I don't know if you guys have been around the, uh, the, the data centers 
physical data centers, but like, oh my God, like to, to push a button and have code infinitely scale, <laughs> it's kind of amazing. <laughs> um, awesome. Looks like we're, we've exhausted some of the topics for today, guys. Um, we can call it um, for, for today. Um, next week, um, actually, let me get, um, uh, David, if you could put your email in the chat box, we can reach out and see, you know, if you want to do a presentation on Airflow in the next com uh, coming weeks, uh, if you're ready next week. Uh, and then um, uh, Airflow, um, I think you mentioned it, William. Uh, if you want to talk about it, that'd be great. Just like a zero to hero, as they say. <laughs> so, so, sounds good. You said uh, next week? You want to do it next week? Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> awesome. So uh, I will put that on the schedule right now. Boy. So Airflow, zero to hero. Uh, <laughs> no, not setting you up for anything. <laughs> uh, setting me, setting me up for success. Yeah, exactly. Um, cool. I, I'll and I'll update and um, and Aqui will help update up on the website. Um, and then D David, whenever you're ready, I think uh, looks like uh, William is more confident as can go. Do you want to schedule? Maybe put it up for the week after. Uh, no, I'm going to say no to that. Let me think about how and what I would present and get a little bit more confidence, as you say, as William has and I do not. <laughs> okay, awesome. Very cool. Um, thank you. I appreciate the, the willingness. Um, and, you know, we'll look forward to the, the, the next week, uh, William, to your presentation. Uh, we will reach out. Um, actually, William, could you put your, I have your email, never mind. I have your email. I'll send uh, Kui your, uh, your email address. Cool. Is the best email for you, uh, your data community C or? Uh, I'll just, I just put it in the chat. Perfect. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, to finish a thought real quick, mm -hmm. the whole, probably the biggest reason we're using function apps or serverless and Azure is because working in a big government agency with a you know strict bunch of uh compliance rules they've just determined whether they really determined or if they just hand waved but they said functions are okay and so now i don't have to scan a box and the kubernetes solution is something we'll want to do when we get more more uh ah sure. yes, yeah but, but, but they're not there so this Serverless functions are just the easiest way to get started and the easiest way to get something productionalized. That's that's a really good that's a really good point. I didn't yeah. think about that. Um, I, I actually recently had a little bit of experience using uh, AWS SageMaker for some uh, sort of machine learning operations. And there, uh, if you actually look at their pricing details and some of their case studies about the cost savings, yeah. as they say, can be like 50, 60 percent cheaper. Yeah. They're most of the savings that they identify is in compliance burden and yeah. the actual time it takes to make sure everything is secure and monitored. Right. Right. Um, as far as the actual pure compute, it's not, it's only a little bit cheaper than rolling everything yourself. Yeah. And, and, uh, well, SageMaker, uh, again, they released it last year. Um, it's, it's got a lot more bells and whistles than just the costs. I mean, being able to do basically auto, uh, auto ML, Right? That's the big cool part of it. Like you give it data, it automatically um, detects drift and starts to retrain. And uh, that's, yeah, there it is, autopilot. Um, but at the end of the day, you have to start somewhere, right? And you don't need SageMaker to start somewhere. You can just start a computer. And then, you know, obviously like they're, uh, they're basically have Jupyter Hub, you know, wrapped around their super cool technology. Um, the other thing that I think SageMaker uses that is slightly different is that they have their own um, CPU that they designed because they had bought this company where um, it's optimized for evaluation. Like literally yeah. the, the CPU is, evalu uh, is for, for machine learning evaluation. Yeah, I think on the, ser on the serving side, especially where they, they've got it running on custom hardware, there's some, some potentially big cost savings. 
on the training side, I don't think those materialize quite as much, but yeah, it's figuring out what is actually more efficient when comparing these sort of these apples and oranges systems gets very complicated. And yeah. if you're working on a small scale, usually the time you spend trying to figure out which one is cheaper, if someone's paying for that means that you've eaten into the savings. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm curious what's gonna, what they're gonna presenting to, uh, my joke is what are they presenting to eat somebody's lunch this time around? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, uh, it's starting right now. Um, awesome. Well, it is top of hour, uh, folks. Um, thanks again for joining uh, Data Engineers Lunch. And looking forward to seeing you all next week, uh, same time, same place. Um, don't forget to uh, join the meetups uh, online and um, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Thanks, everybody, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. See you all next week. Bye-bye.